you, John. How are we on? Hey, David. How you doing? Doing good. So, I guess this will be kind of round round two. <laughs> round two. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining again. Um, yeah. So let's see. I think we are live. So yeah. Uh, happy Halloween, everybody. Um, today is my Halloween costume. I'm going to be an FDA auditor. <laughs> That's scary. That's terrifying. <laughs> what are you going to be, David? Or I guess what what are you? <laughs> what, what what am I? Oh yeah. Yeah for 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 Halloween. For for Halloween, you know, I'm I'm born this year. I I don't have a a costume. My daughter is a pumpkin. I have a four year old daughter, Eloise, and she's uh, she switched around a few times, but she decided she wanted to be a pumpkin, so she's got a cute little pumpkin dress. <laughs> <laughs> what were the other options oh she wanted to be elsa for a bit and then anna for a bit um as from frozen the, the disney movie which she she loves like most most kids uh there was another one i think from the wizard of oz the the one of the good witches i forget her name but i think she wanted to be that for a while too but then landed on pumpkin within the Amazon delivery window, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, that's great. Um, yeah, so I guess I guess let's just go go ahead and jump jump right in the topic. Yeah, thanks a lot, everyone, for, 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 for joining. We're, we're definitely happy to have you. And the format of this call is going to be, like, for the first uh, 15 to 20 minutes, David and I will um, chat about some topic and please write your questions into the Q&A. If you're on Zoom, please go ahead and type your questions in the Zoom chat, and we can also let you let you speak on Zoom. If you're on LinkedIn, please just type them into the Q&A post. And we will look at the Q&A uh, posts during our talk and try to answer questions at that time. But also at the end, we'll be answering all the questions, and hopefully we can get to everyone. Last time we got to almost everyone, I believe. So if you have any questions, please go and queue them up for us. Yeah, without uh, further ado, we are going to be talking about medical device cybersecurity threats. And yeah, David, why don't you, you know, why don't you take it away? Sure, yeah. Last week, someone had a very good question, which was, what are, what are the main threats affecting uh, medical devices? And I think, you know, I did some thinking in, in reading about this topic uh, in the last week, and I think that... Um, so something that's very interesting is malware affects a lot of hospitals, and that's in the news a lot, and it's top of mind for most people in the space. But it's not it's not clear in many cases that medical devices are involved in in the malware attacks. Um, in a few cases, they have been. In fact, there was a report put out by the HHS in mid 2023, which I can go ahead and share my screen. Basically, says, hey, you know medical devices, it doesn't seem like they've been a, a main part of these threats. Um, and yeah, so while while available data on cybersecurity instance does not appear to show the medical device vulnerabilities, you know, di disruption of the devices is is critical. But so so I think, you know, what, what are some of the threats related to medical devices? I think one is exploits from a malicious network. So if, if there is an exploit and they're is like often these devices are deployed in the hospital network along with other medical devices having attacks come from the side uh, and that there have been incidences, incidences of that occurring. Um, that's one threat, especially if you have hard-coded passwords that are widely available. Uh, another, another threat is just having outdated dependencies, especially in, if you have a cloud-hosted device. Yeah. So th those are, those are two common areas. Um, maybe, maybe this, I'm kind of jumping around here a little bit, but maybe even to take a step back and, and we can kind of keep going through some of the threats. I think, I think it's worth like when we, when we think about the time that we're spending on medical device, cybersecurity, kind of allocate this time to different purposes. And I've got this Venn diagram that I like to use. So let, let's say we're spending time developing a, a software bill of materials. Well, why are we doing that? So of course, one reason is to make the device secure and that would fall into the orange circle. It may be because the hospital IT departments demand that you have an SBOM to sell to them, uh, in which case it would fall you know, in the green circle or overlapping. And then 
course, we know the FDA since March of 2023 is is requiring an SBOM as well. And so when we when we think about medical device cybersecurity, you're keeping in mind there's some things we're doing to make the device secure. There's some things we're doing to satisfy the FDA, and then there's some things we're doing to satisfy the hospital IT networks, and these don't all overlap. I think on our, on our previous call, Yujan had some good questions about, I don't know, like what, what would make them overlap more or less? So for example, um, what would we expect the FDA to, uh, for this circle to grow and eventually overlap with the IT, hospital IT's needs? And, uh, I don't. I don't think so because I think the hospital IT is thinking about HIPAA and other regulations that are outside of the FDA's jurisdiction. Um, so I, I do think there are needs that hospital IT has that FDA isn't going to enforce, and this affects medical device manufacturers because when they get onto the market, they then they have to fill out. Uh, often will have to fill out a form, the MDS-2 form, and they can have difficulty selling to the hospitals if they don't meet uh, some of the key requirements in that form. Yeah, like um, like the like the FDA, I guess the, like, like, like the question I have um, is under what circumstances or why do we think that these circles just don't completely overlap? Like what are the, what are the underlying regulatory reasons, government reasons, legal reasons, technical reasons, I don't know, like, but what are some factors that that are in play that cause these circles not to overlap? For example, uh, to, to satisfy FDA and to make the device more secure, the, the reason some of these might not overlap is because FDA, like when they put out guidance, you have to put yourselves in their shoes that you can't really specify everything, right? You can't be super specific for everything or be very conservative and require everyone to do everything, right? So I think because of that reality, it's not going to be a perfect overlap all the time. Like there will be things where the manufacturer decides, hey, we're going we're gonna to do this to make the device more secure, but we're, we're not necessarily doing it just to satisfy FDA. And similarly, like, why doesn't the blue circle overlap the, the green one? I think it could be statutory authority, right? Like the like FDA can't regulate the user needs and requirements for hospital IT. And like, I think, yeah, I think FDA is moving more into like putting the cybersecurity on the quality system side, which maybe could, could enlarge that sphere of influence for uh, the the green and blue overlap. Like I think on the quality system side, those tend to overlap more than maybe on like the device security side. But yeah, I guess, I guess any more ideas on like these, so I guess there's like a network here where there's three and there's uh yeah, I guess there's three, uh, there's three edges in the graph and there's three nodes and there's three edges. Like what are those three edges and why are they separated now? Yeah, I think I think like you said, the, it's impossible given the huge array of devices, the array of uh, intended use environments. Like there's the hospital network, there's devices that are deployed at home. It's g given that variety, it's impossible for FDA to make regulations that apply perfectly to everyone. So in the in the perfect case, everything the FDA would ask you to do would be really critical for making your device secure. And nothing would be, you wouldn't have any wasted effort, right? Like like the stuff over here that you're doing to satisfy the FDA that doesn't make your device secure in a sense is a waste of time, right? Um, it's it's not actually making the device more secure. And the, the FDA is trying to make these overlap and I think doing a pretty, pretty reasonable job, um, but it's never going to be perfect. And then likewise, you're going to have things that because the FDA doesn't want to be so conservative, right? They could take the approach of just, just be really, really conservative and then all the device companies have to do every possible security control they can imagine. But of course that would make that add a lot of waste. So they're not gonna, they're not gonna do that. And we can talk about some examples of uh that might fall out here later on if we want. Um but 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 nevertheless, there are things where you as a company are gonna say, hey, we we wanna make our device secure. We don't want to um leak 
or, or lose confidentiality of patient information or have some even worse, have someone get hurt. And so we're going to do these controls, even if we could submit to FDA and they wouldn't bother us about it. And even if we know the hospital IT is not going to demand it of us. So I think between these two, that's why they don't overlap. And then, yeah, I think like, absolutely. Like, there's jurisdiction reasons and, um, why, why these aren't going to overlap. And the FDA is really focused, like you said, on the device and not the broader environment that, um, that mm -hmm. you're going within. And what are some examples that fall within these, these, uh, these regions? Like I think we mentioned, uh, Having an 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 S bomb maybe is that would overlap all three of them, right? And maybe like just in the hospital IT sphere is like the MD, the MDS, um, I believe. Like that, I'm 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 not sure about you, but every but every time I fill one of those out, it doesn't seem like it's making the device any safer. Um, and, and also, I, I I don't think it's needed to satisfy FDA, or at least like there may be some overlap there. But for for purposes of clarity, like say that they're separate. Yeah. And what are some examples for the other regions potentially? So I think an example that would would either fall out here or would fall in in the middle would be uh, ISO twenty seven thousand one compliance or SOC two mm -hmm. type two. Uh, compliance. So those are those are two standards that really secure the device manufacturer. And if you're hosting your software in the cloud, or there's a component of it that's hosted in the cloud, chances are the hospital IT will want to see that your, your company's IT security is, is, is where it needs to be. This is things like, you know, if someone leaves your company, we, uh, you know, remove their logins to the AWS account, right? They, like we have procedures for, for tracking yeah. that. Um, now, FDA cares, if, there's some overlap. FDA does care about the, the software development lifecycle and, and securing uh, the process from writing the code to deploying it. But, but there's a lot of aspects of SOC 2 type 2 that, that FDA is not going to care about. And, but the hospital IT very well may care about. Um, and I would say, you know, you know, some of the, some of those controls I think are important. Some may be less important. So maybe it'd be an overlap of falling in this area, the green, and then the green and orange. Gotcha. Yeah, and this and, and this kind of dovetails with one of your previous LinkedIn posts, um, where you talked about like ISO twenty or like sorry, FDA doesn't care about your ISO twenty seven thousand one certification. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I get this a lot because you know we we often have clients coming to us to help with the cybersecurity for their device for upcoming submissions. And it's really common for people to say, well, we, we passed ISO 27001, so we're we're pretty much mm. there. But the problem, the problem is that that's not usually the case. Like that, that's great. That it is all useful things, but it's really focused on the, the IT of your institution. And it, it's really worried about different things than the medical device security, which is what the FDA cares about. And so, I guess I, I think it's an important point. If you're new to this, don't don't think just because you have ISO twenty seven thousand one uh, compliance like you're you're in good shape because that's not the case most likely. So I think yeah, I think an example that would fall out here is um, if we go over to the FDA guidance. So by the way, for for people on the call, we have a lot of great cybersecurity resources on our website. Some some pretty in depth articles, but we, another thing we also have is transcripts of the FDA guidance. And what what these are is we we take the official PDFs from the FDA um, and we transcribe them uh, so that we can link to particular sections with our clients. Anyway, anyway, so in Appendix One, FDA has this list of security control categories that they suggest that you uh, implement in your device. And of course, not we don't generally think all of them apply to every device. There's there's a lot of them that don't apply. Um, and what we've typically seen the FDA do is if you have to have at least a couple requirements in each of these eight categories, so authentication, authorization, and so on. And if you don't, we'll 
we'll very consistently see them flag you and say you have insufficient, you know, confidentiality controls or insufficient resiliency and recovery controls. This one's pretty common for people to miss. Um, and but they're not going to make you do everything. And but there's lots of cases where you a lot of the controls in here really do make sense. But FD is not going to make you do it. So I would say that that's an example where like hey, you could get away with just doing one of them or a couple of them, and FDA is probably not going to ding you on that. Uh, they, they do seem to be getting more sophisticated with their reviews, and maybe in the future they would. But anyway, I don't know, John, that, that's a little long-winded, but that's an example I think that could fall out here. Yeah, that, that certainly makes sense. I think I think another one that could fall out there um, is like business reputational type risks, um, perhaps that I guess it's saying that the to, to, to just to make the device more secure, but maybe like what would the manufacturer care about that the FDA necessarily does not care about and that hospital IT wouldn't care about either. But yeah, probably like probably like reputational damage to to the to the company due to some cyber attack. Um like internally, like if they leak everyone's passwords or something like that, or um Perhaps those accounts aren't tied to like a medical device about hospital IT or, or FDA doesn't doesn't care about it, but still it is um, something the manufacturer would care about. What are some examples of just the blue region? Uh, it sounds like those are not necessarily wa wasted effort in terms of the security and like these are things that you want to minimize. What are some examples of that? Yeah, that's that's a good good question. And I guess some some people might be more or less cynical about how much of what the FDA requires you to do. Like, so if, if you're if you're more optimistic, you might think it's more like this. And uh, if you're more cynical, you might think it's more like this. I don't know. But um, <laughs> uh, so so in, in, in any one of these, I, I think you can say like, hey, in a particular case, hey, this feels like kind of unnecessary, but in um, in general, it it feels necessary. So okay, what, what would be um, some, some good examples where, where I, I consistently feel like, hey, this feels less useful. Multi-patient harm view, um, or like these, like these, like security views, sometimes feel to me. Sometimes it feels like a, a documentation exercise. Yeah. Some of them do. I, I, I think though, yeah. Certainly, it's tricky to get the format, it, the way the FDA likes to see it, and where they're not going to ask a lot of questions. But, but I do believe you know, having good diagrams of your system and using those to help you identify risks is, I, I generally find it to be pretty helpful. Now, it's, it's unfortunate you, you do need to kind of understand how they want to see it. And there's all these real specific things they like to see in your diagrams. And for, th th this is an example where I think it's overboard and we generally don't do this and also generally don't have FDA calls out on this. But you can see for every communication path that exists between two assets, and security use case views, you know, including kind of internal connections. And then they have this big list of, you know, things that they, they want to see um, for each of these. And that it's really quite a bit of information that I, I don't think is, is that useful in many cases. Um, so that would be, that would probably be a good example. This is yeah, I'll say like the like like the cases that we typically deal with are like uh, software only medical devices, right? Is is that what you mean? Like the in 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 most cases, the cases that that we deal with, or like do you do you mean just kind of in, just kind of in general? It's not really in yeah. I would say I would say even in in general, having all of this detail for every communication path is is extreme. Now, certainly, I think for yeah. I, I, I see your point, actually. Yeah, yeah. I think for SAMD especially, but I I do think um, for for devices that could directly harm the patient, uh, insulin pump. I see lots of recalls for for um, not not insulin pump. Uh, oh, me, a blank on the name, but the the, the pumps that that deliver to the to the patient. I, I see a lot of recalls for those, and and I can see if you have a network connected, you know. I've, can't believe I'm playing on the name of this, but but I think for a device like that, being really thorough about every communication path and thinking through all of this for everyone probably makes sense. But for a lot of the like CMD devices that are kind of separated from the patient, they're more helping the radiologist or you know cardiologist or wh whatever clinician review report. 
I think having a detailed breakdown of every communication path, is, it's really not that useful. Yeah, that, that, that certainly makes sense. It also makes sense if you put yourself in the shoes of FDA. You can't create like a general purpose guidance that would fit for everyone, right? And, and I feel like they they might tend to take the um, like the more conservative route in hopes that the industry will like meet them in the middle. But also like like how would you? How could they have captured all the nuances that say, okay, you need to do this if it's this, if it's this, if it's this in this particular scenario? You, you just can't, right? So if you put yourself in the shoes of FDA reviewer, user needs for the industry, hey, the guidance document's got to be kind of like relatively short. I mean, the, the, the cybersecurity one's already, in my opinion, really long. So, hey, it's, it's got to be somewhat short. It's got to be concise and you know, kind of ask for a bit more than what you think you're going to get and maybe you'll land somewhere in the middle. Like, I think there's a lot of that uh, as well. And if you put yourself in FDA shoes, then it kind of makes sense. Like, hey, like, the, like the, the spirit of this guidance, what, you're, what they're saying here is probably not like, like we, like we don't need to do all of this stuff for this category of device. And like, like, like the spirit of the guidance is different than the letter of the guidance. Uh, yeah, I, I think, I yeah. think that's, I think it's exactly right. In like in this diagram, we can kind of blow this out <laughs> to add another level. Because in practice, the FDA does not require you to, to do this, right? Just to be clear, like, like it's in the guidance, but but we often do not do it. And we I, I would I think we have had FDA calls on it like once or twice. They want more detail, but 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 I think there's a difference between what, what you see in the guidance, just reading it by the letter and then in the spirit. And that this is a little bit more narrow, yep. more nuanced. And like probably if you had a higher risk device, they would demand this, I, I would imagine. Um, and yeah, and I think the way to do the right balance um, is to definitely involve your engineering team in in in, in this discussion. So I think the the engineering team has a good idea of the size and shape of the orange circle. Yep. Right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. And the uh and, and like the regulatory oriented team know the size and shape of the blue circle, perhaps more on the bigger end. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but when you combine the two, right, I think then you'll find that happy medium, um, or I guess you'll be able to make that blue, that big blue circle as small as possible and overlap as much as possible with the, with the orange circle where, where you want to be. But um, like I've seen a lot of, a lot of our, uh, or like 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 I've seen um, med device organizations try to keep the two separate, like you know, two separate silos, and have just a loose, just have like a loose communication pathway between the two. But then what ends up happening is you have not only a much bigger blue circle, but you have even less overlap with the with the orange circle. Yeah, and it and it makes the engineering team and the regulatory team a lot more cynical about everything. It's like, oh, we're we're doing all this random stuff, or like the like the software engineers think, oh, we're doing all these things that are just adding no value, and then the regulatory team thinks that like the engineers are just combative and they just they just don't want to do this stuff. And I think like you were mentioning the like if you're cynical, like it's it gets further apart, but it's a self fulfilling prophecy in that case. Like the the two teams just drift further and further apart and you have worse outcomes but yeah that, that, that would be my advice like if the like if the engineers think that it's um uh, it's going a bit overboard it I, I think it probably it probably is and like that's a good sign to probably, probably th rethink that process of what you're doing is really needed to make the device more secure yeah i i, I completely agree with all that i i have seen <laughs> So yeah, you've seen it play out in a bad way. I, I I do think to be fair to the regulatory side, I do think there's there's times when the engineers downplay some of the security risks and are like ah like so so there's there are I do think there's value in the regulatory perspective pulling saying hey like we should do this the engineers may resist totally um, like 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 I think I think the um the engineers have a lot of can have a lot of unknown unknowns about like what's needed and like the brainstorming activities do 
do genuinely help. And I think that does need to come from the regulatory side. Like you can't, you can't really ask someone, Hey, what, what things do you do not know about? Um, right. The, uh, the only way to do that is to put forth like, okay, here, here's some options that we need to do. Like we need to do threat modeling using stride and you have to go down each one and brainstorm. How does this happen? Like that, I think does need to come from the regulatory side is and to, exp- yes, to really get the unknown unknowns out of the engineering team. And, and, and one of my, one of my favorite ways to do this is in the, the TIR 57, um, which is, is, is really good. Um, Going through this Annex D, there's a big detailed list of questions. I found engineers will often roll their eyes a bit because there's there's a lot of them. And, and then a lot of the questions won't apply to your device. But I very consistently find going through it is useful, even if it's informal. Like I, we, we used to do it where we would document every single one in our security risk assessment. But uh, we now shift it a little bit, a little more flexible where we'll still at least go through it. Um, sometimes, depending on what the client wants, we'll, we'll have the full list in there. But um. Anyway, this is a paid uh, uh, document you got to buy, but it's it's quite good. And yeah, I, I don't think the engineers would just do that for fun, but uh, I think it's a. I, I think going back to the original question uh, of what what are the threats facing devices, like I think keeping in mind the different stakeholders is is important when approaching cybersecurity. I, I think another thing to keep in mind is the variety of the use environments that the devices are deployed in. So there's there's a device that is deployed in the ICU, maybe on the same network as other high-risk devices. There's also devices that are likely deployed in a separate network that are more isolated, but still in the hospital. Then there's there's cloud deployments. Maybe there's cloud deployments that have a local component. We see that pattern pretty often. There's uh, Devices deployed in a lab environment, a lot of IVD software projects we, we work on are in that area. Uh, and then there's also home use environments, which are quite different and have different different threats facing them, um, including just people forget passwords or lazy, or I shouldn't say lazy, but we're all busy, right? We have we have a lot of things going on. And so I, I think the threats threats vary quite a bit. I also think that to really understand what you need to do to make devices secure, like in the ideal case, it's coming from the perspective of someone who's really managing this in the real world. Like they they manage hospital IT and they see the real threats they're dealing with. Just being upfront, we, we're often focused on the pre-market phase, helping our clients get through the FDA submissions. And we're often less involved in the post-market and, and even less involved in like how it's deployed in the real world. So because of that, I think our our ability to comment on the specific threats facing devices in the wild is is largely limited to reading industry reports and commenting on findings from there because we're not in the direct path of that. Um, and I, I'd say I, I started talking about this earlier, but this this report in other you know threat landscape analysis reports like this, is kind of where we're the the perspective we're coming from, and then on top of that, trying to pull things from OWASP lists that are applied outside the medical device space and following best practices there. Um, but yeah, any, anyway, hope, hopefully that provides a little more context on maybe the am, ambiguity in some of the answers that that I was giving at the beginning. But sorry, we've been talking for a while. Should we switch over to questions? Maybe. Yeah, yeah let's see if we got any. We have any questions? Yes, we have a comment from Bilal. It says uh, the way I see it, there's a disconnect between the sales and marketing and the regulatory process and requirements. Yeah, certainly like the like the marketing strategy, at least in the in the pre market phase, whenever you're getting FDA clearance, there there is I think a strong consensus between what is the marketing going to say about your device and what are you getting FDA clearance for. Because there's a strong consensus there, but I think you're right in that in the post market, that consensus tends to get a little bit blurred and a little bit squishy. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's what you meant um, by by the comment, but but yeah, like like I certainly think that uh, not just the engineering team and the regulatory team need to talk, but also the sales and marketing team um, also need to be involved 
in that conversation. I'm not sure about like cybersecurity in general, how that, uh, how the sales and marketing team overlaps, but definitely like the intended use of the device and not overstepping your, um, your FDA clearance. Uh, it, like it's important to, to involve all those parties. When, when uh, David, and, would add to that is I do think doing some advanced research on when we start selling this, what are the needs of the hospital IT teams? Like there, there's uh, like a, a common issue is cloud deployment versus on-prem deployments. And for certain types of devices, there's hospitals that just won't buy cloud deployment. And so it may be the case that you need to support both. And that can be very painful if you realize that after the fact. The other, the other thing you might realize is, hey, if we're doing an on, on-prem deployment, what are the the needs to, to get it installed quickly and going through the process with hospital IT is very, can be really painful from like, I would say three months to a year. Uh, I mean, can you really go on and on? And um, I think having some firsthand experience on the constraints there to inform what your architecture, your software architecture, how you deploy it, um, you know, how you support things like backups and various other HIPAA, security controls so yeah the follow-up blog, blog clarifies so yeah uh as an example hospital it may require mds2 and soc2 as well yeah yep absolutely okay so, so we have a question from michael um michael's asking so you give uh um some sort of inspector your code base and they do a code review i i, I believe uh that the question was about was back when we were talking about like how to make the the uh i think the orange circle like how to make that more more secure and then the questions about it uh what what role does code review have uh in the cybersecurity um management process yeah i, I think code review is really important um is it Shout out, I would just mention, we have a really in-depth article on code reviews that you might want to check out. But um, def definitely a big believer in code reviews and it can check, it can catch things that are really difficult to catch in other ways. So I, I definitely think having, like we, we like to have a checklist that's enforced in the GitHub pull requests where it, it has, you know, you've considered safety risks related to these changes. You can, and then adding one, to consider security risks. And especially, you know, you can make it more specific for your device if there's certain things that you think are really important to be covered in the code reviews. I think that that can be really helpful. This isn't really code review, but but certainly having tools like Sneak or there's some there's some open source ones or even like GitHub. Um, I think you need the GitHub Enterprise for it, but the GitHub security, where is it? Um, that typically runs like whenever, I guess for the non-developers on the call, so typically the software developer will write a bunch of code. And then there's this process called a pull request that integrates their, their new changes, the changes they're making to the code into the, the main line of the code. And that's that's typically the step where the code review occurs is, is, is when you're doing the pull request review. But another thing you can do is you can have automated software checks that have to pass before you're allowed to merge the code, that you, the changes in your code into the main line. And what you can do, and what we really almost always recommend our clients do, is set up a tool like Sneak to run. And you know these these automated tools, just like you'd expect, sometimes they have bad suggestions and stuff. But overall, they've really gotten to be pretty good, and they can catch a lot of basic security issues uh, at lower cost than having a, a, another engineer check it. Uh, so, so I'd say this is complementary to code reviews, but something we really recommend. Um, and I guess since I'm talking about it, other things that are really worth doing is uh, monitoring your SBOM for vulnerabilities. I say worth doing it, you have to do um, to, to comply with FDA guidance and regulations. Um, but monitoring SBOM for vulnerabilities, having a process around that, having uh, software requirements for all your security controls and then having ideally automated tests to verify those controls. And ideally having those tests run on every pull request so that just like this SAS tool, 
having it run and be checked automatically before you can merge your changes in. That's another best practice we suggest all our clients follow. So hope, hope with that answers your question and a little extra. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I guess the only thing I would add to that, um, I think like gen AI tooling, it's actually like this, this could be an excellent use case for, for using tools. Yeah, I'm not sure what's already out there, but like tools that can do an automated code review of code bases, not just of like pull requests or, or, or changes to the code, but just like periodically look at your code and um, perhaps even perhaps even open up a pull request that says, anyway, you, you, here's some cybersecurity threats that we've identified. Um, you know, like you might want to sanitize this input here, or you might want to do this at the other here. Like, I think that that could be a very uh, useful use case of um, of the upcoming AI tooling. Definitely. So let's see. We have another question from from Cooper. Yeah, thanks a lot for your question, Cooper. So Cooper asks for for med device that interface with other devices cleared prior to the cybersecurity guidance of last year. Is there a need to consider those older medical devices as potential attack surfaces? What controls might be necessary to ensure the origin and validity of the data from those devices? Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a great question, and it this might be a complete random tangent aside, but uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna attempt this anyway. It, 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 yeah, can I share my screen, David? If you could, oh, uh, of course, yeah, yeah. If you could, if you could release. Um, let me just uh, share. Is the screen share coming up? Oh, sorry. Yep, I can see it. All right, cool, cool. So let's say that this this big cloud is the hospital IT environment. Actually, let's just say kind of wrapped around this um, larger is just the U.S. healthcare system. All right. Um, let me just see if I could see if I could do this. I'm not sure if I'm going to pull this off, but if this is the U.S. healthcare system. And let's put yourself in the shoe of, of FDA reviewer. So this is U.S. healthcare. Obviously, there's there's a bunch of hospital networks out there. Um, this is not this is not the only one. You're going to have lots of others, and they will they will talk amongst themselves using various protocols. And also, w within one hospital network, let's say that this is your device. And you're not going to have control over exactly what other devices that you will communicate to or the devices that will that will also communicate to you, right? And if we put ourselves in the shoes of FDA, what jurisdiction do they have? Like, how could they, like the, like the user need of the uh, uh, cybersecurity guidance document and just cybersecurity in general, I think is more on the U.S. help, like, U.S. public security and just maintaining security of our entire healthcare system, right? I think that's the ultimate goal, right? Um, but the tools at FDA's disposal is mostly around individual devices. And also, realistically, it's mostly in the pre-market. Um, once devices get FDA cleared, like post-market surveillance becomes less of a less of a concern for the manufacturer. So if you're, if you're FDA, I think putting emphasis on having controls in the, in the, in the pre-market and, uh, and having controls one device at a time, I think that's like the tools that you have available. So um, I think it's similar to like herd immunity. Like if you, um, like in this, in this hospital IT environment, we can kind of think of this as a herd of like of like IT of uh, of 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 other medical devices and yours. Like you're you're one part of the herd, and like you could have a uh, pathogen that comes from the outside or from within. And if if the individuals in the herd have uh, exceeded some sort of vaccination rate, then the the uh, pathogen won't be able to spread and and uh, and then you won't have a pandemic on your hands, basically. I think the way to think about cybersecurity is in that that concept where you're trying to be a good citizen 
um, in the overall uh, in, the, in, in the overall environment. So, so you want to um, consider like if you zoom in, because this is all you really have control over, right? Is you have control over your device, what goes in and what goes out of it. You don't necessarily know all of the actors that are on the outside, be it old devices, new devices, or in the future devices that you don't even really know about. But it's more, how can you secure the uh, like ports of entry and exit? And this is why FDA asks you to list all of your, all of your communication channels in and out. But I think it w it would be it would be exhaustive, um, maybe overly burdensome to consider all permutations and consider like all all of the older devices that are on the market that are not the not the best actors. Yeah, that that's to answer your your particular question. But also an aside, I I think this is how I think about cybersecurity. I think the the intention is kind of similar to here: is you want to be the best um, citizen that you can with the. In with the with the overall effect, the the emergent property is that the like the hospital IT itself becomes more resilient if the individual actors are more resilient. Like there will be less pathways for for like malware to to traverse if everyone is following the um, the uh, 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 if if everyone's following best best practices, there should be less pathways, um, and therefore in and, and an attack that would have been possible is now thwarted because there isn't a, a pathway between the two. Um, but that's like an emergent property. And from the tools that's given the FDA's disposal, they can't really uh, enforce on the hospital IT network level. They can't tell the hospitals what to do, but they can enforce it more on the device level. And that's also what you have more agency to control. And maybe a few things I'd add to that. So like, I, I definitely think you should consider uh, threats from the older devices that aren't secure. And FD is pretty explicit that you need to do that. And, and, it, and the threats are even clearer if you know you're integrating with specific devices, you can be more specific than in the case where it's just any gen general device that happens to be on the same network. But 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 being realistic, like like you can, you know, you would, this, I'm just making up an example, but like a code injection attack where, where there's like a DICOM tag that has like a, a cross site scripting thing embedded in it, right? You could imagine something like that. You, you should try to make your device secure against that type of thing, but you're not gonna be able to know that the data that's coming in is good. I mean, to a degree, like there's nothing you can do about it. So anyway. Yeah. Yeah, wish, wish we had some more guidance on like how much time you should be spending on it. But, but at least I haven't really been able to come up with like a concrete number. It's like, when do you know if you're going overboard on on this yeah. stuff? It's kind of a judgment call, I think that, uh, yeah, so, I don't know. I Certainly you can't, you can't use the argument that a lot of companies used to use, which said, oh, the software runs in a secure IT environment that's made to a hospital. And you're just, yeah. The, the shared responsibility between you, the, the medical device manufacturer, and, and the, the hospital IT, you're pushing all the responsibility on them. The FDA definitely will not go for that. Uh, and that's very clear in the guidance and in the deficiencies that we've very consistently seen when companies come to us looking for help. So, All right. So I guess uh, there's one more question from, from Cooper. Uh, are, are there any particular automated testing softwares you guys have worked with that are easy to validate as per FDA computer software insurance assurance uh, draft guidance? That's a good question. I'm not aware of mo most of these tools are made for more general audience, and so they don't they don't come with like pre like validation uh, documentation for you. I, I haven't seen any tools written specific, just because, yeah, the, the, there's no, in a lot of cases, there's not much differentiating the med device market um, from from other markets, and they're not going to restrict themselves to just the med device market. Um, that's That's been my experience. So yeah, I think you'll have to validate it yourself. And like by by validate, like my my recommendation for something like this Keep it as simple as possible. And the way I've done this in the past, I would even argue if, if it was even necessary, but um, to uh, 
validate something like a CI server that that runs tests is just to have a, a dummy test case that always fails, and you just verify that that test case always fails, and you know, that um, that was the extent of I think useful work that had come out of the the tools and process validation for the testing tools. Yeah, that would just be my two cents. Like I wouldn't spend a lot of time on that. Um, I have like two tests, one passes, one fails, mm -hmm. run it, and then that that will that will I, validate that that's that, that generally I think this type of that type of stuff falls in the area where it's you need to do it for the FDA, but it doesn't really make the device safer. <laughs> in almost any case. Like these a lot of these tools are so widely used, it's really unlikely your validation is gonna find something where yeah, that that I, I personally think that stuff's usually a big waste of time. Yeah. And also if there's like already a downstream way to catch errors, like, like for example, you shouldn't validate uh compilers or um or anything like that because if you're because if you're compile well first of all, how, how do you invalidate something like this? Um it's it's a good question. I can't really think of any solid ways to do that. Best way to do it is to compile it, run VNV on it, and if it works, then you know, you know your compiler worked. Um, it's unlikely that any additional defects would have been injected at the at the at the compilation stage that we wouldn't have caught in VNV. Especially true if your compiler is used widely, which usually it is. It's just not really a worthwhile exercise to go in and attempt to uh, validate something like that because there already exists robust downstream ways to catch uh, any errors and also this is widely used. So, and in, and you can think in in the particular case of like a, a automated testing tool, like it's it's unlikely that you're like like it's unlikely it's going to work and all your tests are going to pass and the tools like broken in a weird way where like like it's just a very unlikely situation now here's an example of something where I think like tools validation is important. Um, I, we, with uh, a lot of times people have some formulas in an Excel spreadsheet for safety risk management. And it's, I've seen it happen a lot of times where those formulas are wrong. And it turns out they, they're wrong in a way that makes it look like every safety risk is like, doesn't need a mitigation or is acceptable when in, in reality, <laughs> the formula was just outdated or like had a, a typo or something. So and, and that's like seems so simple, but what, what can happen from that is you, do, you just don't spend energy on something you really should be spending more energy on, even following your own process. Um, but but this is different though. It, it, so, so I think like doing tools validation for a, a spreadsheet like that makes a lot of sense. And there's other examples, but for something like a testing tool, I, I especially if it's widely used, I, I just think it's almost certainly a waste of time. So just do the bare minimum you got to make the FDA happy and then move on to something more useful. Also, I think I think like uh code editors is another thing where it's just use this is useless to do tools <laughs> validation on that. Like I think it's like I've seen this in especially larger companies that they have tools like probably that that's done for other reasons, not necessarily just for just for quality systems. Um, but I think that's that's another example. Yeah, we should do we this is one of those like strong opinions that probably a lot of regulatory people might dis might disagree with in, in our experience. So you, John, we should do some LinkedIn posts on this. We'll probably get a lot of likes and stuff. Or maybe lots of um, thumbs down. I don't know. I guess LinkedIn doesn't do that, but uh. it's the best way to piss off engineers if you if you lock them into a particular set of tools that they don't want to use because of some tools validation. You know, I think there. I think it's a better to pick a fight in other areas than, than this one. Let's like save the show, like save the social capital for something else that, in in our opinion, really does matter. Uh, <laughs> we, I think we can say with it without naming. I mean, we've seen engineers quit companies because of this, like because it's so it's so demoralizing to be like validating these systems where you're like, this is totally pointless. Like I, I think. I, I I don't know you John what we've been saying online, but I think we we know of at least examples where, where in, and in the end it makes the device less safe actually ironically because it's like you're you're wasting all this time on something that's not needed, and it uh, re, yeah and and it makes 
like you, your engineers are doing good work, like <laughs> really just like even leave. Um, but yeah. yeah, let's anyway. see. I think we have one more. I think we have one more question, or we have time for one more. Um, but it looks like we got through all the questions. Um, so yeah, it's great. Well, uh, oh yeah, uh, happy Halloween, everybody. I hope um, hope this was a useful conversation for you guys. Of course, it's always always a lot of fun for us. Um, I've learned a lot from this call. So yeah, I, I I hope you guys have a great week and and definitely build devices that 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 you would use on yourself and also on your on your family members. And as long as that's true, do as little in that blue circle as possible but make sure the first item is true so all right we well, all have a great great rest of your great rest of your week thanks thanks you john Bye. all right thanks david see ya yeah.